Hello everybody, uh, my name is Dominic O'Brien, I am the eight times world memory champion and I'm in the heart of London in Watkins Bookshop and I produce quite a collection of books with Watkins. Um, how to pass exams, how to develop a brilliant memory, I've got one here, you can have an amazing memory. I produce so many books now I'm running out of superlatives, I have to start recycling them. <laughs> so obviously I'm going to be talking about my favourite subject, memory, and I believe memory is the most important of brain functions and if we take care of it, if we exercise it regularly, it's going to keep us smart late into late age. It's a case of use it or lose it. And before I forget to say it, um, my memory is a trained memory. I didn't get on very well at school. I was diagnosed with dyslexia. I believe I had attention deficit disorder as well. Um, the psychologists hadn't invented ADD in the 1960s, but that's what I believe I had. I find it very difficult to concentrate and remember what the teachers were saying. Uh, you wouldn't have thought that that little boy would go on to become a memory champion. So something happened along the way, which I'll tell you about. So memory is <clears throat> something that we take for granted. It's, it's instant. If I say the word, I've got an elephant on my tie here, an elephant pops into your head. Now I use imagery associations a lot and people think, and they make the mistake of thinking, well I can't imagine an elephant in fine detail. And that's not important. You don't have to come up with a high definition representation in your head. It's just the impression of an elephant. But what's important is all the associations you make with that elephant, whatever the object is. It might be a natural history documentary, it might be the artist David Shepard. It reminds you of something else. This is the mechanism by which memory works. And we take this for granted. It's just superb. It's extraordinary. Until things start to go wrong. We've probably all had those senior moments, which worries us slightly. But if you can imagine, there's a guy called Clive Wearing years ago, who was a brilliant musician and he was struck down with an illness which attacked a part of his brain called the hippocampus which is responsible for storage and retrieval of memories and it started to eat away at his hipp hippocampus so much that he was only able to remember up to the point in which he had the illness so he could no longer store new information which meant he was left with a 30 second memory worse than a goldfish and every time he saw his wife he would say darling I haven't seen you for years he turned away look at something else and see her again say darling I haven't seen you for years and there's no cure for this so that is my worst nightmare on the other hand we have people like uh, Stephen Wilshire you might have heard of who's a brilliant artist you can fly him in a helicopter over London the landscape or over Rome for 20 minutes and for the next three or four days he will faithfully reproduce the landscape in immaculate detail and that's the closest I've ever come across of a, of a photographic memory People get, there are myths about memory. They, they say, do you have a photographic memory? I certainly don't. It's all the use of techniques. But he's the closest we've come to it. <clears throat> and then we have the, probably the most famous memory man, Kim Peek. Has anybody heard of Kim Peek? The film Rain Man with Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise. Well, they modeled the film on Rain Man on Kim Peek, who had an extraordinary brain. We all have two hemispheres, two brains in effect, joined together by a thing called the corpus callosum, which is like a highway with an exchange of information. Well, Kim Peek didn't have a corpus callosum, or a very small one. So it was like one congealed mass. And it meant that he could read a book, he could look at the left page with his left eye, the right page with his right eye, and read two pages at the same time. And in his lifetime, he read something like 12,000 books and he was able to remember all the information. He gained all that knowledge. Um, absolutely extraordinary, but he was one of a kind. Now, these days, I believe knowledge is not power. It used to be. It's what you do with the knowledge. We have an abundant supply of it. And really, we're getting a bit lazy with our memories. We don't need to store it. It's, we store it in the cloud. We have social media. We have search engines. But long ago, particularly in pre-literate time, Neolithic times, memory, uh, uh, knowledge, therefore memory, was power. And there's a fascinating, revolutionary new theory coming up from a, a Dr. Lynn Kelly in Australia, she's producing a book soon, that these stone circles, in particular places like Stonehenge, were places of learning. She called them memory spaces. 
So people would go to the elders who had all this knowledge about animal behavior, plants, making weapons, navigation, and they would learn from these memory spaces. They would be taught this knowledge. And the stones, because everyone was unique, were symbols, they were mnemonics, where the information was stored. It's a fascinating theory, and I, I actually think it has a lot of truth in it. So in those days, memory, knowledge and memory was crucial to survival. Now the way technology is going, we're in 2016, and there are people working on it right now, is that soon you'll be able to have an interface connected to your brain, hooked up to the World Wide Web. Now what is the effect of that? Well imagine you want to know anything. Let's say you want to know what is the deepest lake in the world. Suddenly a voice will pop into your head and say it's like Baikal. Or you want to know the price of gold, the spot price of gold, and you'll know it's $1,256.78. Now the question I ask the audience is, if you're the first person to have this, and perhaps the only person in the world to have this facility, would that make you the smartest, possibly the most powerful brain on the planet? What do you think? Who said no? Why not? Why no? Yes. You're not actually learning anything. And this is the trouble these days. We're, we're, we're looking, we're searching for information. And the search engines are making connections for us. And we're learning passively. And it's making us more and more impulsive. We know we don't have to store the information because we can find it again on the internet. So knowledge is not power. It's what you do with the knowledge that makes you smart. It's taking disparate pieces of information that you've already laid down, you've created memory traces in your brain, and then you come up with something new, that eureka moment, that problem-solving formula. And the analogy really is it's we're living, fortunately, in the Western world where food is easily available, we just go into a supermarket, we don't have to hunt for it, we just take it off the shelves. And we've learnt that if we're not careful, we eat too much, it's not good for our health. And if we eat wrong types of food, we get things like type 2 diabetes. So we have to work it off. We have to be careful. We either diet or we physically exercise. And we're getting to the stage now with information, with knowledge. We no longer have to work at it. It's there. But we need to offset it. And I believe the best way of doing it is to exercise our brains. And the best way to do that is to exercise working memory. Now there are so many benefits to this. I co-founded years ago the school's memory championship. So we give, we go around to schools, we teach them techniques to students and they use them to help them study more efficiently and pass exams hopefully. I was talking to a colleague of mine the other day and he said you know the most amazing thing about these techniques is it takes away the stress of learning. Stress, uh, learning can be terribly stressful. When you look at a, a whole topic or a subject you've got to study, it's a mountain. But these techniques enable you to look at information just once and the majority of the information if you organize it properly will go into your long-term memory but there are techniques to help you keep it there. It's called space repetition. Also, you can use these techniques in business if you want to upskill, learn a new trade, remember names and faces of clients, sales figures, delivering a presentation, for example, but also later on in age to keep the lid on senility, to put the brakes on the aging process. Um, it, it really is a case of use it or lose it. Playing games with your brain. Now, back in 1987, I saw a guy on television memorise a deck of cards, which he did in just under three minutes, just by looking at each card once. And that was the most fascinating thing I ever saw. And it literally changed, it sounds a bit of a cliche, but it changed my life. I just, I, I've got to know how this guy did it. And in those days, there were no books on how to train your memory. I didn't know of any. So I had to sit down and try and work it out for myself. And it took several days, if not weeks, before I perfected a strategy, which I thought was unique was in fact used centuries ago, used by the Romans and the Greeks. And you've probably heard of memory palaces. How many people have heard of memory palaces? Sherlock Holmes was talking about memory palaces. Well, I coined the term the journey method, which is using familiar locations, a sequence, a journey of stops, where I can plant information that I see just once. So I code information like playing cards, numbers, even names, whatever it is and I plant them, it's a bit like a train journey at different stations. And because I'm able to imagine this and make 
associ strong associations, it's very easy for me to pick up the information. Um, at the World Memory Championships, these days, the competitors spend six to ten hours a day training for it. I'll just give you an idea of what's involved. This is a page, a thousand numbers, 25 rows of 40 digits. This is just one page of about three that you have to memorize in an hour. And the idea is you read through the numbers like a book and commit it to memory. You have 15 minutes to memorize hundreds of words. Uh, about 6,000 binary digits, ones and zeros, to memorize in half an hour. 200 names and faces. 30 decks of playing cards to memorize in an hour. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, I should get out more. Um, <laughs> Back in the 1990s, journalists would say, well, really, what is the point in doing what you're doing? Computers can store information. And the answer I normally give is, well, what is the point in running around a track 400 meters, going around in circles, not going anywhere? What is the point in 22 fully grown men trying to get a ball from one end of a field into a net at the other? And I heard some screams earlier, cheers. Obviously, England had just won in the Euro 2016. It's not the ball being in the back of the net that's the point, it's how it gets there. That is the art and science of football, of ice hockey, of whatever it is. And it's not the order of a deck of cards in my head that's important, but that is the art and science of memory. And more importantly, I believe it reveals the very essence of the learning process. Now, The way I do it is I use my working memory, which is slightly different from short-term memory. Working memory is your mental working space. Now, I think at this point, I'd like to give you just a, a short demonstration. Okay. So every time I click my finger, I want you to give me a, a number between zero and nine. So if I go like that, you can say zero, or whatever you want. Okay. We're going to start off slowly, and then we'll speed up a little bit. I'm going to try and do what, maybe 30 or 40. Okay. So after seven six, wait till I click. Seven six. Two. Nine. Throw that number backwards. Do you want me to do that or forwards? Sure. If I can. Yeah. So it starts with a nine. Well, it ends with a nine. Yeah. Yeah. Just say yes. 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 Three. Yes. Two. Yes. Four. Yep. Five. Yep. Three. Yep. Six. Yep. Seven. Uh -huh. uh, seven. Mm -hmm. Five. Yep. Nine. Eight. Yep. Seven, two, three, four, yeah. eight, yeah. six, yeah. six, yeah. seven, yeah. eight, three, two, nine, yeah. four, yeah. five, five, seven, yeah. uh, eight, five, six, nine, yeah. four, one, four, five, yeah. nine, two, six, seven. Yeah. Is that correct? <laughs> what is interesting about that is that. I'm going to carry on talking, but I'll, that number is still in my head. It's gone into my long-term memory. It'll be there for a good 24 hours. If I want it to be, it'll be there for the rest of my life. And the way I can do that, the techniques are in the book. It's knowing when to review it. But I'm using my working memory. My short-term memory has actually been scaled down. Now we think we can hold about four pieces of information. It used to be seven plus or minus two. It's now four. That's our short-term memory. So I was using my short-term memory as, I was, as you were giving me the numbers. I was turning those numbers into pictures. And I was fusing these pictures with older memories. I was using journeys. And I was creating new connections in my brain. It's almost as if I'm semi, I'm tricking in my brain to semi-believe an experience. Don't worry, it doesn't make you mad. It's, it's an exercise. You can all do this. The reason I'm fast is that I've trained my memory over years. We could have done 50, 100, 200, 500. The result would still be the same. I could go through the number forwards and backwards. Um, Dr. Tracy Alloway, who worked at Stirling University, has been doing research using these techniques on working memory. And she's trained 30,000 students, a lot of them with dyslexia, attention deficit disorder, the problems I had. She now claims that she can um, predict a student's grades with 95% accuracy by measuring their working memory. Really, working memory is the key to success in learning, not just in learning, but later on in life as well. 
Um, the way I describe another analogy is that you've got to know your forgetting threshold when you start training your memory in this way. It's a bit like the old circus act with the guy with sticks and plates spinning them. So you'd spin about ten, and the first one would start to wobble, so you go back, spin those, and then work on the next ten. So this is a bit like your memory. When you start doing this, how much information can you store just by listening or reading through it once before the first few bits of information start to wobble? Well, as you train your memory, you start to memorize more and more information. Now, obviously, you don't want to train your memory to memorize numbers or playing cards. It's very useful in casinos. Um, by the way, I did a documentary in 1997 where I went to Las Vegas and turned $20,000 into $30,000. I'm actually barred from all the casinos in the UK because I use this to memorize uh, blackjack odds. Um, so the, 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 the applications are absolutely endless. All right, I think we're at the point now where you know, this dyslexic dunce at school, school can become a Melbourne memory champion, so you can too. You all have this potential. Memory as a game, so when we go into schools, we get children to play the game of memory, and then eventually the penny drops and they realize, well, actually, I can use this to help me learn languages or mathematical equations, and then they develop their own systems. Once they start playing it and we give them uh, it, the schools that enter the school's memory championships, everybody is a winner because they get a certificate for passing. But we also have gold, silver, bronze. And last year we did a, a pilot with Rachel Riley from Countdown where we had a knockout. We had the eight best students in the country. And they enjoyed playing the game of memory. And of course now they use these techniques. So I would, I would encourage your son just to try what I call the journey method. So just learning a, a simple shopping list of information by imagining it's one of my this books. One? Yep. He's planning to List of words in a split second, and photograph it mentally. You can reproduce it. Since 1991, we're the very first World Memory Championships. We've had thousands of competitors, and no one has been able to do that. I don't believe it really exists. The, the closest was this guy, Stephen Wilshire. The thought of having to learn something or memorize something is, is highly stressful. But once you start using these techniques, it's a bit like meditation because you notice when I was memorizing that number, I had my eyes closed and I'm very interested in brainwave frequencies. I have my own EEG testing equipment so I know that when I start imagining inf information which I turn into pictures, I code to pictures, my brainwave activity actually slows and it's very relaxing. So I start producing things like alpha and theta waves. That's when I'm mem memorizing. It's very relaxing. It's a form of meditation. But when I come to recall the information, my brain speeds up, I go into high beta, and I rattle the numbers out, all the information, whatever it is. So it's really uh, mobility of brainwave frequencies. Uh, this sounds terribly, this sounds like mumbo jumbo, but, but it, it is, it's quite therapeutic in a way. It's very relaxing, very enjoyable once you start using the techniques. There's, there's number shapes, so a three could look like handcuffs, for example, or the number four could look like a sailboat or the number one could be a pencil or something like this. And so to remember three, four, one, I could imagine some handcuffs or being handcuffed to this pillar. Um, I could imagine Eton holding a little sailboat for the number four, and then you're writing something down with a large pencil over there. So it's three, four, one. So that gives you a clue. The journey preserves the order of the information you, that you want to memorize. And actually, as well as real journeys, you can use virtual journeys. A lot of kids like playing shoot 'em up games, and virtual worlds are getting very real. So you can actually use those landscapes as a, as a basis to store information. People say to me, well, I, I haven't got enough spaces, places to put this information. It's a, there's an infinite number of places you can have. A journey could be um, a series of places around your house. It could be uh, your front door going into the kitchen, your hallway, library, whatever your house is, up the stairs. And in each of these rooms you could have four places. You could go around in, in a clockwise fashion. So in one house you might be able to store a shopping list of 50 items, if you like, just by imagining each item at each place along the journey. Another term for that is uh, memory palace. Lines of Shakespeare. Or, I mean, I work quite a lot with comedians. Uh, Lenny Henry is one of my clients. I've been working with him for years, and he uses these techniques when he does a, goes on a show. So we go through the script together, and he'll learn a line, but then the, the way he connects it to the next one is by, by linking it. 
somehow with the last part of the, the gag to the first part so we come up with an image for that but sometimes we'll go around his house and we'll post all his jokes around the house it's, it's quite pleasurable to do that and he's a very funny man and we'll even go into the garden so then he'll pick up the images as we walk around his house and that's the whole of his show in his own memory palace I developed a system called gender zones where you have different areas let's say you're learning French or Spanish so you have a gender zone you have a, a male area which could be everything in a city and the female area could be out in the countryside so you create images from words um, you know cow is vaca so you might imagine a cow vacuuming in a field it doesn't matter how silly the images are but because it's out in the country you know it's female feminine again it's, they're all in the books it's a way you, 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 you will be amazed. I mean, one of the tests I give students is to give them 20 objects. And they, they get about three minutes to memorize them. And the average is about nine to ten that they get right in sequence. But after they've had the instruction, they're able to memorize 20, 30, 40 objects. Um, I used to be a consultant for the BBC, well, I still am for the BBC in programs like Friends Like These, Saturday Night Shows, where I'd be given contestants challenges on the show and I'd have half an hour to work with them and after half an hour they would have the ability to remember 30 or 40 objects in sequence. So very quickly you'll see results. Because we all have an imagination, that that's what it's all about. Um, when I saw this guy on television, that, that's what really started off this journey to find out how he did it and then I realised I could do it myself by using journeys using my imagination. So the three things really, the use of association, that's really the mechanism by which memory works. Um, locations, places, to put all, to store the information so you can know where to find it. And then the fuel of memory is really your powerful creative imagination. And the more you, your imagination, what you say was imagination? The, that is the fuel of, of memory is your imagination. Sorry, I'm going all poetic now. <laughs> is stress I and mean, it could be a trauma in the, in the, like, it could be a physical trauma but, or a mental trauma it doesn't matter there's a disruption there in, in the frequencies um, but the, as I was explaining earlier when you start using these techniques it forces you to imagine scenarios uh, and then you you're able to access these frequencies very calming frequencies so it slows your brain down and if you do it on a regular basis I mean I try to memorize two three four packs of cars a day or a couple of hundred numbers or names or whatever it is um, and it just keeps my memory sharp so you're never too young you're never too old to start training your memory and measure yourself as well keep a tally of your how much you're able to memorize uh, yeah, diamonds, JD would be Johnny Depp um, ten of diamonds could be David Cameron lives at number 10 Downing Street in charge of the wealth um, who's the queen of nightclubs Paris Hilton, uh, Ace of Spades, that could be um, Alan Titchmarsh, a gardener, famous gardener, Three Wise Men, etc. Now you've learnt your language, you do this for all 52 cards, you can imagine seeing these people along a journey, but also they can interact with each other, so Ten of Diamonds, Ace of Spades, that would be David Cameron using Alan Titchmarsh's action, which is digging with a spade. If it's the other way around, it's um, Alan Tishmar Titchmarsh holding the door of number 10 Downing Street. So these are complex images, interchangeable. Why are images so much easier to remember? Because we're, most of us are visual people. But it's not just the images, it's, it's like a story as well, using logic. Why is Alan Titchmarsh holding the door of number 10 Downing Street? Sometimes the stranger the better. Sometimes the stranger the better, but logic is very important new information, unintelligible information. It could be um, law, if you're studying law, or it could be a complicated mathematical equation with, with different shapes. You can assign characters to those. They're training six to ten hours a day. The, the record is 18 seconds to memorize the order of a shuffle deck of cards. But I also hold the world record for memorizing 54 decks of cards shuffled together on a single deal. So you can imagine 2,808 numbers spoken once. That's what I do with the cards. You still got that piece of paper. The memory of those numbers, I think, have been strengthened. They're still there. 
So I'll go over it this time very quickly from the beginning to the end. So it's seven, six, correct? Two, nine, five, four, one, four, nine, six, five, eight, seven, five, five, four, nine, two, three, eight, seven, six, six, eight, four, three, two, seven, uh, eight, nine, five, seven, seven, six, three, five, four, two, three, nine. Is that correct? <laughs> so it's actually it's actually getting stronger, my memory, because my brain cell networks of neurons have been talking to each other. So isn't this fun, all these images? The difficulty is trying to get rid of that number now. <laughs> because I can see the number laid out on a trail. So all I have to do is walk backwards through my memory trail, my journey, and pick up the images. The, yeah, I've coded it into images. I'm just reversing the process. If, yeah, if it was ten of diamonds, ace of spades, if it came out in that order, it would be David Cameron digging. And if you asked me to go through the cards backwards, I'd think of Alan Titchmarsh first. Ace of spades, ten of diamonds, going backwards. I'm going back and reversing the story. Not changing the story, it's walking backwards you, you, you through it. You can just reverse the and You keep this, you know, some useful information, useful knowledge in your brain for long-term storage and retrieval. And you'd be surprised, there's, there's not many reviews you need to do, but you need to know when to do it. And every time you review, the gap gets longer before you need to do the next review. Yeah, I, I think I'm, sh I'm certainly sharper than I was when I was at school. I managed to fail most of my exams. There's a bit of a cheek that I've written a book called How to Pass Exams. <laughs> um, also, I've said the importance of measuring. So I measure myself, how long it takes to memorize it, like a 200-digit number or a deck of cards. So I know what shape my memory is in. And uh, when I retired from competition back in 2002, I entered a couple of years ago, and I actually found that my records had improved. Uh, and I'm coming up 60 next year, and I want to start training again to enter the senior category. You have to be 60 or more, 60 plus, to enter. So uh, I'm still keen on uh, competition. What you do in that way involves the function of memory, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a matter of organizing information. So, I mean, memory is one part of it, training your working memory, organizing the information. You need to know how to make notes as well, efficiently. And I highly recommend mind mapping by Tony Bazan. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Where you, again, you're putting information into salient images. Tony Bazan, mind mapping. So you're lifting information in the written form in, into a form that you can understand. And then comes the process of actually committing that to memory using memory palaces. Also knowing how to read efficiently as well, speed reading, missing out all the, yeah. the words you don't need to know, just getting to the salient points. So it's efficient reading, note taking, memorization and reviewing. So stress is one of the worst causes of memory failure. And people that come to my courses, sometimes I do one-to-one, -one. they'll spend a couple of days with me. And the, the first day I, I get them to relax. So without any memory techniques at all, we can go on to EEG testing and I give them audiovisual stimulation, which is flashing lights and sound. It's, it's a huge subject to get onto, but the first thing to do is to get them in, get the hardware right, get them to relax, so they're receptive to take in these techniques. So then I give them the software on the second day, which is the techniques. The brain is incredibly resilient. I mean, obviously, if you've got some physical damage through trauma, then, then it's quite difficult. Um, but stress, like you can relieve stress. You can get over it. Yeah. I know, because I had the stress of school. <laughs> and being told I was stupid. 